so excited to be here with Leah from Fika Coaching. Everybody, my name is Gloria, and this is Getting Real with Gloria, where my journey supports yours. I was fortunate enough to meet Leah actually along my grief journey, and she was the first person that I met in my grief journey, and I am so grateful for that because we worked together and we really just kind of helped me get started in reinventing myself and redefining my life. Just a little bit about Leah. Um, Leah is a certified professional coach with a background in clinical mental health counseling who utilizes nature-based and equine principles to help clients move forward in their lives by breaking through barriers, uncovering old narratives, and finding clarity to lead a life of fulfillment and purpose. And I definitely felt that way with you, Leah. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. You know, what's so funny is you were one of my first clients. Pioneer. We were pioneer blazing. We, yes. Leading the way through healing and through healing with horses. <laughs> and that is such a beautiful thing. Animals in our lives, whether they're dogs or horses or cats or whatever you might have out there. Um, I'd love to hear about sort of what is equine assisted coaching? I know I got a chance to experience it firsthand, but I'd love to hear from you. What is it? Yeah. So equine facilitated learning or equine assisted coaching, there's a few names that kind of are out there, but essentially what it is, is having a human facilitator with clients and having those clients partner with the animal. So it's a horse, um, you know, sometimes people have programs with other livestock animals or with dogs. So, but with equine facilitated learning, we're of course, specifically talking about horses. And what we're doing is really looking at where the client is and where they want to go. And that is through, again, that partnership with the horse. And what's so unique about working with horses is that they have this ability to mirror back to us exactly who we are, but minus the limiting stories that we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so it's a really great option for maybe somebody who has done talk therapy and, uh, you know, maybe wants a break from that or enjoys more holistic ways of healing where you're out in nature. And again, you're, you know, with these big, beautiful animals who have a lot to share with you. Yeah. And I definitely felt that when I was working with saints and it was a very cool experience to come to the farm, uh, up in Ipswich, Massachusetts and get a chance to, really be in the space with horses, not just Saint, but the other horses that were also on the farm and to really feel that sense of connection to nature, which I think so many of us lose in our lives because we're right. busy or because we're just surviving simply. Um, and I remember the, the first time that I came out to the farm and I was just a mess, folks. I was like literal mess. My face was probably like raw and chapped from crying. Mm -hmm. And I almost canceled because I didn't think that I was strong enough to even talk to somebody about the loss. And what I found really inspiring about working with Leah, especially, is her ability to really let you be human in front of her. And um, that's something I know we don't always feel comfortable doing. Um, but what's one of the things or, or many things that clients can expect to sort of get from working with you and with Saint? Yeah. I mean, every client is there for their own reason, right? Everybody's on their own journey, but there are a few common themes that I see, grief being one of them. And for yeah. you, you know, it was the loss of a pet. Um, for others, it might be the loss of a spouse. It might be an empty nester whose kids have moved on and, and life is changing. Yeah. Um, it could be a change in career. So there's many different forms of grief um, and why people come and experience working with the horses through that sense of healing. Other reasons that people come are, you know, one of the big ones is a lot of people just feel really stuck. They don't have clarity around where they are in life. They don't know where they're going. They might have an idea of something they've always wanted to do, but they don't know how to utilize their own skills to get there. Yeah. So a lot of it is sort of uncovering what is getting in the way. And then sometimes, you know, that means taking real actionable steps and working towards a specific goal. Um, you know, so like I've had people who have stepped into other careers or I've had people like yourself, you know, who's working towards a bigger goal now, you know, yeah. so it's really amazing what happens when you're in a space that allows you to see differently. And that's yeah. one of the big things I think that nature does that people don't realize. Technology is wonderful. What we're able to do right now is fantastic. Yeah. We can reach so many people. But when you're in 
your own home or when you're in someone's office where there's a container, it can feel a little bit closed in. It can also feel very safe in that way. So yeah. when you come to the farm, you also have to be as a facilitator aware that you have to create a container of some sort. Yeah. But there's something about like what you said, you know, you came and you didn't even know if you wanted to come, but there was something that allowed you to be human. And one, I would have never known that because when you came, it was in COVID and we were wearing masks. Yeah, yeah, we were. <laughs> I couldn't see really your whole face. I didn't even see your smile until like, I don't even know. <laughs> like a year like, later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like a year later, seriously. But there's something about being able to sit in a field, you know, with an animal and you don't have to look at me. You can look straight yeah. ahead. You can look at the horse. And, you know, sometimes there's an intensity that occurs. That's why talking like so many people have conversations in the car, right? Yeah. Or like, yeah, no, so a true. Walk, or shower. Right? <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. Like there's just something that's a little bit more easeful about it. And what people don't realize that's happening is that you are immersing yourself in a larger nervous system. Mm -hmm. So for people who are healing, you know, emotionally, physically, psychologically, whatever it is that they are working through, when you place yourself in a nervous system that's larger than yours, it has a direct impact on how you feel. Mm -hmm. So when you come to a farm, you're placing yourself in two larger nervous systems. You're placing yourself in nature and yeah. you're placing yourself in a herd of horses and that in itself People, you know, they'll step out of their car and be like, oh my God, I just feel better already just being yep. here. And they don't <laughs> totally. really know why that is. Yep. And it's like, that's why you feel better when you're on the beach, when you're in the mountains, when you're on the trails. It's like, you're in this nervous system that sort of takes over your own and helps kind of bring you back to a baseline neutral state. Whereas yep. if you're somebody who's gone through any sort of trauma, whether it's lowercase T or trap or capital T, you know, you're on high alert all the time. Mm. Yeah. And your body's constantly in fight or flight. And when you can place yourself in these environments where things are more easeful, it helps begin that process of changing and healing from the inside out. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I definitely felt that too. What you said about the nervous system, the bigger nervous system piece, because for me, I definitely had a nervous and I, I'm still working with this even now. I definitely had a nervous system that was tapped out, frazzled and frayed and just didn't really ever feel safe in the environment. So I really did feel that sense of peace and grounding when I met with Saint. And I think that's one of the reasons why for me, equine assisted coaching or equine facilitated learning was such an impactful practice was because Teddy Bear, my dog, the one who passed was, was that grounding presence for me. And so right. with that grounding presence missing from my life, my nervous system was literally searching the world for where it could find that safety. And I just, I really did feel that sense of groundedness and peace when I came to the farm. Um, so I, I loved doing that. And what, what are some of the things that you find clients really need the most help with or that they didn't even know they, I know for me, like there were things that I'll, we'll talk about this, but I didn't even know what I wanted uh, when I came. I was yeah. just like, I'm hurting so much and that's all I know, you know? So yeah. what, what are some things that you've discovered that clients realize, oh my gosh, this is my aha moment. Yeah. Being a sense of being overdoing is probably the number one thing that people don't realize that they need, but once they experience it, they understand it. And that starts to trickle into life outside of the farm, right? So everything that we're learning in our sessions and when you're coming to the farm, the goal is sort of like, okay, how do we take what you learned here and implement it in your life when you're back home and you're back in your normal routines? Yeah. So horses, they just like hanging out in the field with their friends, right? Or, or by themselves. Some horses, you know, want to be by themselves, but mostly, you know, they're herd bound and they're social beings and anything that they are doing outside of eating, sleeping, going to the bathroom are things that we're asking them to do, you know, come into the barn with me, go on a ride with me. We're going to do this today or, or what have you, but their state that they are in constantly is this state of being. And I'll never forget, I was working with somebody and there were a couple of horses that were sort of congregated together kind of in a corner. And I asked, you know, what do you see when you look at those horses? And the response was, they're not doing anything. <laughs> and I was like- Of course we noticed that. <laughs> right, and I was, okay, what if they were just being? Right, and it was sort of this like, you know, again, that mind blowing like aha moment of, we don't have to do as many things during the day 
that we think we do, right? This is all things that we put on ourselves. This is stress that we put on ourselves. We have our to-do list. If I don't accomplish X by the end of the day, then I'm lazy or I'm procrastinating. And now I feel guilty because I didn't get that thing done that I was supposed to do. And being around horses teaches you that being is okay, right? Being is a state that feels good, right? Yeah. Being is a state that grounds us. It teaches us to let go of some of the negative thought patterns that we have mm -hmm. and just allows ourselves and gives ourselves permission to just literally sit, stand, breathe, and just experience what is happening in the moment. And I always say, you know, when I get the question of what's the, the most challenging part of your work, right? It's two things. One is weather, which is out of my control. <laughs> um, and, and the second thing that's really challenging is how you put this work into words, right? Because as you've experienced, it's very much a felt sense. Yeah, for sure. And so we could talk about how great it feels to be on the farm all day long. And hopefully people hear that and they want to experience it for themselves. But it's very different when you are there physically experiencing the sensations and the thoughts and everything that is coming up for you, right? And I always tell clients too, I'm like, sometimes there's going to be days where like, you don't like me very much, like, <laughs> you know, like you're going to be mad at me. You're going to hate me because when you come there, it brings things to the surface that we don't always want to look at, right? Yes. And I always say that if that's happening, then I'm doing my job well and Saint is doing his job well too. Because mm -hmm. if you're going to come and say you want to change, but then not really do the work, then every session is going to be like rainbows and sunshine and we're going to have fun. But it's the days that you leave feeling almost a little bit worse than when you got there, mm -hmm. that all of those internal changes start to happen because you're bringing things to the surface and you're releasing it. And one last point that I'll make about that is that the horses have this way of bringing things to the surface that allow for more acceptance. When a person shares with you their thought, their opinion, their judgment, you know, it can have an impact on us that isn't pleasant or can put our walls up or our defenses up. When horses are literally mirroring back to you who you are, there's not much you can do, but just accept <laughs> that, that it's yeah. happening, right? Yeah. And it allows the person to take in information about themselves in a non-judgmental and in a non-threatening way. Mm -hmm. So that's just the last point I'll make about that. Yeah, I have a couple really uh, perfectly synced uh, pieces to mention that have to do with my experience with you and these everything that you're saying. And one of the things that I noticed was definitely that piece of you don't even know what you want or what you're necessarily looking for until it's right in your face. And one of the things that we discovered was working through the different herd roles and how all my whole life, I was the nurturer role. And that actually wasn't a role I wanted to be in anymore. And that shocked me because it was just a role that was encouraged in my life. And it was a role that was praised in my life. That was valuable. If you were taking care of people and other people's emotional needs, well, then you were safe in the pack, essentially in my family. Um, but when, you know, Teddy passed away, I realized I don't want to take care of people. Like I'm not even taking care of myself. This is, right. I'm miserable in this role and I feel so much pressure in this role. And so it was really, you know, working with the horses that I got a chance to feel like, well, let me take a look at what other roles are out there for me. Oh, the leader role. Oh, the sentinel role. And it was really interesting to see how that played out and where I essentially ended up falling was like, I want to be a leader horse. I want to be the horse that walks around and like leads everybody. And, yeah. you know, Leah, Leah knows how much I struggled with, with getting horses to listen <laughs> to my direction, um, <laughs> which was another really fantastic, uh, a couple of fantastic, you know, things that we did together. One of which was, you know, in becoming the leader was setting the boundaries and how it was really hard for me to lead Saint in any way that I felt or perceived as being mean, forceful, angry, et cetera. Not that I was being mean in the process, but just even giving pressure on the, on the lead to me mm -hmm. was, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm a horrible person. And that obviously had to do with me feeling that way with people. You know, if I express, hey, I need you here. Oh, actually that that's a negative thing. Or now all of a sudden I have consequences for asking for for that. And so it was really interesting to see 
you know, like you said, horses do not lie. And I'll tell you, as much as I love Saint and Saint loved me, that horse did not do <laughs> what he didn't want to do unless he really respected you, unless he really felt like, yes, oh, you know what, this person, you know, their body language is signaling to me that they are in control. Their eyes are pointed in the direction that they are going. Unless I had that power stance, which didn't necessarily come from a place of aggression or from anger, but simply of internal confidence. Only then would say, follow me, <laughs> but never before, never yeah. before. Um, and it was really interesting to see, see that and to see the shift in my energy and what that did to his energy. And then how I was able to use that in work meetings, how I was able to use that with my own dog, my own husband. Um, and that, again, I think a lot of us think about boundaries as, oh, that's either we have to be super you know, sort of powerful in establishing those boundaries and being an aggressor in order to keep those. And so, listen, sometimes there are people where you do have to have that kind of boundary, but for the most part, we can put up boundaries and say, hey, this is what I need. And this is what I'm willing to give. And it can come from a place of just complete internal confidence. Um, and so I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about boundaries and how you work with sure. clients on that and what you find is, is helpful for people. To know. Yeah. And over the last several years, boundaries has become a very big buzzword. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot out there. When it comes to working with horses, a boundary really is about space, right? So it's about respecting space and it's about making requests. And in our human lives, I, it's possible that there's a misconception out there not for everybody, but for some that putting up a boundary means putting up a wall or mm -hmm. saying no. And that can be the case depending on the circumstance right. or the person that you're with or what have you. But most of what the time, what you're doing is you're setting a way of being for yourself that is acceptable to you. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a hard no, it can be a request. So when we're working with a horse, you know, people, one of the first things that happens a lot is like, people are like, I just want the horse to like me. Yes. Right? Well, that was the same. Yep. <laughs> right. You were one of those people. You're like, oh my oh, God, yeah. I just want the horse to like me. Yep. And, and for you, it was following and in falling into that nurture or companion role where you're like, oh, let me pet him. Let me just kind of like let him eat and do what he wants mm -hmm. to do. But with a horse, in order to get to what we would label as friendship, you have to basically allow the relationship to grow so that you're establishing trust and respect. Because if the horse doesn't trust that you're leading it or feels like you can't, or he, or in this instance, Saint, you know, can't respect you, he's just going to either one, do nothing. Like he'll just stand there. As you know, he's very stubborn in that way. Mm -hmm. Or like what I find is like, you could be walking him in a straight line and all of a sudden, you know, let's say you're in the middle of a field and then all of a sudden you're all the way to the left. And you're like, how did I get here? Right. And it's very yeah. subtle, but for the horse, it's like, this person's not leading. So I need to take over. Yeah. Right. And so when you're working with an animal, that's, you know, anywhere from 800 to 1200 pounds, that is, it's a, you have to build that inner confidence. Like you're talking about. So with a horse, like Saint, he is so good at teaching people about boundaries yes. because his <laughs> slogan, if you will, is what's in it for me. Right? Yeah. <laughs> So he's not going to do anything unless there's some benefit to him, right? And so I see this all the time. It's as simple as asking the horse to back up. So there's a few things that happen. Body language has to be placed correctly, which we, you know, I would teach you. It says anywhere, it's like that saying, um, oh gosh, I'm going to butcher it totally now. The saying about energy and sort of the flow and where it goes. Oh, um, where you know thought goes, energy flows. Correct. Oh, okay. So there's many of them, but yeah. Yes. So that one, but you know, when you're standing facing a horse, if you're turned to the right, but you're asking the horse to back up, well, your energy's turned to the right. <laughs> so the horse is going to be like, okay, so you want me to go right? Or do you want me to go backwards? Right. So it's a mixed message. So there's always communication that's built into this at the same time. So your body language is the first part. The second part is your tone of voice, right? So you hear all the time people are like, can you, can you back up? Well, back up, Saint, back up, back up, please. And he's My just looking please. at you. Yeah. yeah. How many yeah. times I was like, please, please, <laughs> you like me, Saint? please back up. Right. And then your own inner feelings start to come up. I don't want to yeah. hurt the horse. Yes. I don't, you know, I want him to like me. I don't want him to be mad at me. Right. Yeah. And he's just standing there like, 
I'm happy just not doing any work, right? Like for him, he's like, this is the best. I'm just standing here. I don't have to do anything. And so the boundary with, with working with Saint in particular, what it teaches you is to be firm, but fair. Yes. I love that saying. Yeah. Firm, but fair. And that is how we want to build our relationship with any horse that comes into our life. Because if they don't respect us, we're going to have a really, really hard time working with that horse, right? And you're going to have a really, really hard time if you go into your office environment just wanting people to like you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely, you know? it translates to people for sure. Absolutely, right? So when you get somebody to the point where they can firmly but fairly ask the horse to back up, move left, move right, right? And this can take 30 minutes. This can take a whole hour for some people. I mean, I had somebody who was literally like, I, I'm not, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't, you know, they were so stuck on hurting him. And I was like, you know, you have to imagine that this animal is like standing on your foot. Then are you going to ask him to back up? Mm hmm yeah. Right. So the boundary piece of it is really teaching the human how to make those requests in a way that are firm, but fair. But more than that, it's about the follow through. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you ask him to back up and he doesn't move, a lot of people just stop. And what does that teach the horse? You got, he doesn't, <laughs> you can just say no, move. and then I will cave. <laughs> right. So, you know, I always kind of give this example of if you are somebody at home, whether you have a husband or you have children, and let's say everybody's on the couch watching TV and you ask one member of your family, hey, you know, your turn to put the dishes in the dishwasher and nobody moves, you know, okay, so-and-so, can you please put the dishes in the dishwasher, please put the, you know, and then there's no follow through, right? And so what happens? Mom ends up putting the dishes in the dishwasher, pattern ensues, and you know, you're you never can't. making that request that's firm, but fair. And so the follow through, you know, it's not there. And so working with the horse teaches you in real time that you're not going to get the result that you're looking for unless you follow through. Right. And same with boundaries. You can talk about setting a boundary all you want, but until you put it in place and you actually follow through with it, then that's when things will change. Yeah. And I, I love what one of the things that you brought up when we were working with that boundary. And I remember Saint pushing me into the fence one time. I remember, you know, you, you'd start here, like you're this far apart and then you're this far apart. And um, so, yeah, I had many of those moments with him. And I also had a moment where I, in the beginning, I almost cried because I like literally couldn't tell him that I needed space. And that was a pattern that I had developed with a family member. I was used to people crowding my space and I was used to not having, you know, personal, even personal space. I was used to not having that. Um, and many of us who have experienced trauma or, you know, sexual abuse, you will know that like your personal boundaries are not, are not your own during that time. And so it was a pattern that I had learned. And I remember working with Saint and him coming into that physical boundary space and me being like, I can't push him away because all I could see was a sweet face in front of me. And that to me was saying, well, then it means I don't love you. And one of the things that you brought up with me, which was really one of those game changing moments, which I definitely took with me outside the paddock was love means having boundaries, especially self-love. Self-love means having boundaries. The people in your life who truly love you will respect boundaries. Healthy people respect boundaries. And so for me, working with boundaries and working with Saint, who I of course wanted to love me, and I have a natural love for animals, I think many of us do. And so having that idea of like love and boundaries can coexist and this is healthy and this is normal was just so new to me. And I remember thinking, gosh, like I really wanted to take that and see what would happen if I tried that out in my life. And I just for all of you who are watching who are thinking about you know, trying out uh, equine assisted coaching with Leah. After that, I ended up going on to establish boundaries with a family member who I had never been able to do that with really before. And I got exactly what I figured was going to happen, which was a bulldoze of my space imme almost immediately. Like it was a small, it was like, oh, your boundaries are cool for about a couple of weeks and then no more. Um, and so ultimately what I ended up having to do was establish fir the firmest boundaries possible. Um, and that ultimately gave me success, but it really wasn't until I worked with St. and Leah that I was able to 
you know, realize that I wanted that, realize that that was healthy and safe for me to have, and then realize that I actually could have that. And so it was really cool to see how that developed. Another thing that was really awesome was that we were um, working together initially. And I remember I didn't even know what I wanted, but by the time the session ended, I knew I wanted freedom. And that was something too, that has stuck with me for a really long time because we did a lot of work with values. Yeah. And values and how so much of the value systems that we have are not actually our own, but are often, you know, either either taught to us at a young age. And we say, well, we don't have a choice. So we're saying yes to this. Um, yeah. Or we we do uh, listen to our community members and we listen to the, the TV or the movies that we're watching. And we say, oh, this feels like a value of mine. Um, but as we grow and as we transform that's when we really, it benefits us to look at our values. And so what's one of the things that you love about working with values? Because this was something that we did a lot of that was really life-changing for me. Yeah, I, you know, you we go through this list, right? And there's so many values. And people are like, 50 out of 100 of these are 10 out of 10 important to me. It's like, okay, great. Let's try to like narrow it down to like your top five, or if we can, even like your top three. And what we really want to look at is of those top three to five values that you have, are you, it's one thing to have them and label them as very important, but it's another thing to be enacting them out in your life, mm -hmm. right? And so typically when people come, what we uncover and what we realize is that the values that are most important to them are the ones that are currently out of alignment, right? So the top values in your life usually shift and change depending on the circumstances or whatever's going on in your life. So for you at that time, freedom was something that was highly important to you and still is because you didn't have it. Yeah, no. Right. And so we're always looking at these values that are a little bit out of reach and trying to figure out a way to bring them into our life. And for you, the freedom came from putting those firm boundaries in, in the way that you had to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think sure. one thing that's really important too, if I go back to that just for a moment, is that, you know, you have a dog, I have a dog, we love dogs. Dogs are different species, right? They, you know, and not all dogs, but the majority of them, you know, they like to cuddle up with you and, you know, they love affection and play and doing things with you. Horses value space. Yeah. So they will groom each other. Some horses are more affectionate than others. A horse like Saint, he just likes to stand with you. And so for someone like you to realize like, oh, space can equal love. It's like, yeah, like he's happy to stand near you, right? And if he walks away from you, it's not personal. Right. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't love you. It just means that he wants the grass that's on the other side <laughs> of the field, right? But we conjure up all these reasons why mm -hmm. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. This, you know, saint doesn't love me, you know, whatever it is. And when saint is affectionate, I always tell people, I'm like, take it because he doesn't give it, you know? So when he does that, it shows that the trust and the respect is really, really there. But then sometimes he gets very nudgy and very pushy, right? So there's a yes. difference of allowing <laughs> him to come into your space because yeah. it feels good versus him coming into the space and pushing you into a fence, which is very different. And like, we'll just say like pushing you into a fence, you know, nothing happened. You were saying- No, no, folks, this is, is like fine. the gentlest it of sounds, like- It sounds scarier than it is. No, no, yeah. It's like negative five miles an hour that, that movement happens. It's just like a, it's like a head nudge and kind yeah, of push, yeah. <laughs> push you back, right? And those are the moments where you're like, hey, you can't do that. Like, that's not okay with me to push me around like that. And if you don't tell him that, he's going to keep doing it. So yeah. it just going back to the boundaries, like it just gives people that real time practice. Yeah. And what I always say to people is, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, is this okay with you? And for many of us, it's not, but we don't even know that it's not because right. this is what love looks like for right. our family members or, or our partnerships or whatever. So we're so used to love in being sort of a pushing in on your space, whether it's happened slowly over time or whether this is just the practice that we don't even realize that we have a choice or that love exists in any other way. Yeah. I would say my number one saying with saints is I love you, but <laughs> I'm always like, I love you, but get away from me. Like, you know, it's, it's this constant, you know, back and forth dialogue that him and I have of like being close, but then like asking for space being, and we do it to each other. 
Like there's times where I want to be close to him and he's like, no. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, then I have to figure out how to make myself feel better in a way that's not, you know, projecting my stuff onto him. Right. And then there's times where he comes over to me and, you know, we're affectionate and, and it's lovey and it's, it's fantastic. And then there's times where I say, okay, Saint, that's enough. Like, you know, good. Let's, let's keep doing what we're doing or, or whatever it is. So. Yeah. And I feel like when we feel more confident in our ability to do things like self-soothe our nervous system or to feel more confident in the way we feel about ourselves, it's easier than for us to have that space and it yeah. be okay. Um, yes. And I feel like that, you know, not that we're we're saying that you can't, you know, be a super affectionate person if your love language is touch, for example, and, you know, that is totally fine. But it's just that if you have a, a family member whose love language is touch and yours is not, and that touch is being forced on you all the time, Correct. that's where healthy boundaries can really not only, you know, help the person who doesn't feel like they want that touch, but it can improve the relationship too. It strengthens the relationship that you have. And then sometimes it's just a matter of the relationship is not healthy for you and it never will be. And then that's sort of in my situation, as you know, that's what ended up happening for me is ultimately the boundary um, folks that had had to be set was not having this person in my life anymore. And that was the firmest boundary I could draw because all of the other boundaries I had set and followed through with were not respected. And so just, you know, for anybody to take it to that yes, final level, for anyone who's listening, who does have a toxic partnership or family member or friendship, and you are just at a point where you want something different, but you don't know how, how to make something be different or how to transform that. This is exactly the type of, you know, coaching or practice that you can do with someone like Leah, who is able to then take you where you need to go, but also re realize that every situation is going to be unique. So maybe your situation is not going to be like mine and you are going to be able to set healthy boundaries within that relationship, which are going to be able to strengthen that relationship. Like I've had that conversation with, um, you know, other family members who have had different love languages and we are now even closer than ever. So I just want to, you know, preface that by letting people know that just because you set boundaries doesn't mean you're limiting people from your life, but I have experienced both sides where sometimes setting boundaries just beautifies this relationship and really does make it so much more stronger and healthier and makes you a better person in that relationship. But then there are also times where your freedom comes from releasing that relationship. And for me, I don't think I ever realized the freedom I was able to experience in my life by letting that relationship go and how much happier I was and how much just, it was like I was in a cage my whole life and then I just let myself out. And that, that I mean, for that alone, I could thank you and say all day long. Oh, it's so um, amazing. But the other thing that was really fascinating that happened, I really wanna talk about today as well, is really asking for help. So, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking about boundaries and we're talking about values and all these things are fantastic, but sometimes it's just as simple as getting the support that you need. Yeah. And for me, the first exercise that we ever did um, <laughs> was one, and I won't, I won't give away the details because if you do this exercise with Leah, it's really important that you experience it firsthand. But um, through this different exercise, I was given a series of guidelines and I had to do this exercise by myself was the guideline. Um, and I didn't know how to do it because um, I'd never done it before. And so I struggled and struggled. And I think I struggled for a good 30 minutes and I was sweating. <laughs> it probably I was wasn't like, that long, but it probably felt like 30 minutes. Maybe it wasn't. Yeah. Maybe it was like 10 minutes, but it felt like 30 minutes. I was sweating. My face was beat red and I like had no idea how I was going to do this. And my fight or flight response had kicked in. I was like, oh my God. And Leah said something to me. She said, why aren't you asking me anything? Why aren't you asking me for help? And I was like, well, you said I had to do it. And you said, yeah, but I never said you had to do it alone. I never said you couldn't ask questions. And that to me was like, oh my God, I never ask for help. It's like, like listening 101, right? I'm like, wait, what? You can ask for help. Like, even though you have to do something by yourself, Right. You know, we have to all live this life by ourselves, essentially. We have to all walk our own paths by ourselves. But like, whoa, we can actually stop and ask for support. Yeah. That was <laughs> like so huge for me. 
and such a, a pivotal, like, or I should say like crucial tidbit of information to get at the beginning of my grief journey, I feel like, because when you are going through loss, support is so important, or if you're struggling with mental health or anxiety or PTSD or trauma, whatever it is, support is really the thing that gets us through. And actually they, you know, studies have shown that those who are supported during a traumatic time will likely not end up getting PTSD. It's those yeah. of us who are not supported during trauma that end up with PTSD and so, or anxiety or chronic long-term illnesses, even from trauma. And so that just learning that I could ask for help was huge. And I think there's a lot of us that don't know how to do that. Yeah. Right. It can be for a multitude of reasons. People might feel ashamed to ask for help. Yeah. They might feel embarrassed. They want to look on the outside, like they have it all together. Yeah. Um, right. Or, you know, for someone like me or someone like you who are largely independent, you know, women, it's like, no, I'll just do everything on my own. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm guilty of this all the time. I'm always like, I will do everything in my power to figure something out myself before I ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like one of the last things that I'll resort to. And it's something that I have to, you know, actively work on as well. Um, and have gotten a lot better at, but you know, there, it's this very simple exercise. And like I said, you know, a little bit of it is just listening, right? So it's kind of like you're back in school and it's like, am I paying attention to the directions a little bit, but we just go into that. A lot of us just go into that default mode of like, mm -hmm. oh my God, if I don't figure this out myself, then I, I'm fail, I'm failure. Yeah. Like I'm, yeah. I'm going to fail at this. And yeah. I don't want to look stupid in front of anyone. And, you know, I want to do it well. And I want to feel this sense of accomplishment. And, you know, we just don't even, our minds don't even allow us to go to the space where we could turn and say like, can you help me with this? I yeah. don't know what I'm doing. No, we don't. And it's really, it's wild to think, but I, for many of us, I feel like when we're younger, you know, many of us may have had a parent who did it all. And like, I know my mother was someone who she did everything by herself. And like, I never saw her ask for help. And I, I saw her do it all on her own. So to me, I was like, was oh, this is a parent that doesn't ask for help, but gets it done. And meanwhile, of course, as a child, I don't know my own mother's struggle and how much pressure is on her and what her you yeah. know quiet time looks like. But that to me was one of my models. And then you can also have like a different parent who they are absent and so you as a child yeah. have to learn to you know as we call it the hurried child syndrome where you are forced to grow up quickly um, you have to grow up because we don't have time to nurture you and so you're going to have to do it all alone so you know for those who are out there who might think I feel like I asked for help it's it's interesting to kind of look to see like do you really ask for help when you need it or do you wait until you're flailing drowning in order to get that support and, I, and yes, of course, you can always ask for support when you're drowning. Like, absolutely. Yeah. But I love the proactive support because it's like, oh, I just feel a little bit of weight on my shoulders. I'm going to ask for support and just. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That was a fun one. It's funny. You had mentioned it. And I was like, I don't remember what I, it's funny how like your experiences, I love that they stay with you so oh, yeah. vividly and so strongly. Right. Cause I had to, I was like, I don't remember. You have to tell me what we <laughs> <laughs> what exercise was that? I was like, oh, is this one? Um, well, yeah, no, it was you know, so impactful. But you I want to go yeah. back to acknowledge you too for two two things that have popped into my mind during this is, you know, you set the healthy boundary for yourself and, and allowed yourself some freedom with that family member, but you also did it at work. I did. You just did it simultaneously. Yeah. So for you, it carried over there because you were overworking yes. and not being acknowledged or recognized or compensated for it fairly by holding that firm boundary and stating what it was that you needed and what you wanted, we're able to get to that point. Am I, am I correct? Yeah, no, that, that, yeah. that is absolutely. Yeah, no. So I, I, that was definitely something for in the workplace. Many of us have not learned to have a voice in the workplace. And yeah. that was really, for me, I hadn't, it was really empowering to be able to have those conversations. And I did get much more support in the workplace after that. Yes. Um, from my boss. And then I also did advocate for a raise because I was too afraid to ask for raise. I was afraid to get fired. And so I do feel like for us, you know, having those boundaries, both in our personal lives, but also in our professional lives, then that allows us to thrive 
you know, financially and it allows us to thrive emotionally because we're not bringing all that work stress home with us. So yeah, it was really, and even to this day, like I know I'm constantly, my trauma therapist just said this the other day. She's like, oh, Gloria, we've made you so good with dealing with conflict now. <laughs> just like marching in there, like always like, Hey, no, this doesn't work. And this doesn't work. So it's true that, you know, you can, even if you feel like your workplace is, you know, very dominant, a dominant place, you can learn to feel more empowered in your workplace. And I, I'm somebody who definitely has seen that shift and it definitely makes me feel less afraid in my life, which is mm -hmm. huge. Um, and gives me more self-confidence and more self-worth, a greater sense of self-worth too. Yeah. And then the other thing I want to acknowledge you for is that very early on, there was an opportunity not just to work with Saint, but to work with Rupert. Oh, you that's right. Rupert? Yes. Yes. I do remember Rupert. But you voiced that there was something about Rupert that reminded you of, of Teddy. And that was incredibly hard for you, whether it was like the coloring, the personality of, him, of Rupert. And there was a day where you were like, I can't because it was too much. But then yeah. there was a day that you actually, if I recall correctly, like stepped into that and were like, no, I'll work with him to help you get through some of your own grief. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and instead of avoiding him at all costs, because yeah. he reminded you so much of, of your yeah. grief and, and what was happening, yeah. you actually kind of stood right in front of it and faced yeah. it. Yeah. Right. And so that it's amazing to see you know, the growth of when you came to me and when we first talked, because I had been there too. I had lost my dog and not long, but um, my first dog, I think only a few months before you lost. Yeah, Teddy. it was. It was only a few months. Yeah. yeah. And so I had been right where you had been and just, you have these life milestones, you know, with your animal or with people in your life and all of a sudden it's gone. Yeah. And you're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to make sense of this. I remember I still went out for walks every single morning for a long time because I, without, you know, having an animal with me, because it was just like, this was my life. This was my routine for yeah. so many years. And I don't know how to do it differently. So it's just been so amazing to see you who was, you know, if you don't mind me saying kind of like a shell yeah, who I was. you are now, yeah. yeah, right? And now you're bright and you're vibrant and your energy and you're glowing. And, you know, you've oh, done a lot, you. you've done a ton of work on yourself, you know, not just with me, but with others and have had, you know, just an immense, immense amount of growth and progress. And I just, as your former coach, <laughs> but we're still connected, like just how incredibly proud I am of you. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you so much. <laughs> you're welcome. I, I just really I, I in some ways I, I can't believe the change either like, I'm almost like how how did this happen uh, and I do feel like that's one of the things well you did lost. it you made it happen I, I yes yes I did um yes I did um but I also made it happen because I reached out to the people yes. who could support me in that journey and that is such a huge you know piece to the puzzle when you are working through whatever it is whether it's trauma whether it's loss having that support of someone being able to guide you, it makes all the difference. And it also allows you to keep going. It gives you more energy. I don't know that I would have been able to, you know, not, I don't want to say push through, but navigate, you know, the loss, the seizures, the abuse, yeah. the, you know, PTSD, like all the stuff that happened after that, you know, I don't know if I would have been able to navigate all that without the support. And so by working with you, it also gave me, which was really helpful, a foothold so that I already had a solid foundation by the time I was diagnosed with functional neurology disorder. And so when the seizures did start to happen, I was able to advocate for myself with my doctors. And that was probably something I wouldn't have been able to do before. I was able to say, no, I need that MRI this week. Um, you know, no, I still can't speak. I'm going to need to see somebody. And this is probably conversations I never would have been able to have before because I was so worried about people pleasing. And I was so worried yeah. about, you know, making a good impression and how my impression was based on my self-worth and all of that jazz that kind of happened. Um, so the, you know, I'll say like the after effects, like the side effects of all the work we did were really cool to see too. Like where, like you said, you go in the paddock and you learn these skills, but you walk out of the paddock with this whole set of resources and skills to rely upon that you're just continuing to work 
you know, with, but also expand upon. And that I think is so cool. Yeah. And, and I think what's amazing too, for anybody watching who might be going through their own trauma right now or their own grief right now, and it feels impossible Yeah, right? uh, yeah. because you've had your experiences. We didn't have time to talk about, you know, sort of my experience today. Maybe we do that on another call, another time, sure. but when you're experiencing grief or you're experiencing a life-changing moment, it can feel like I'm never going to feel yeah. myself again, yeah. or I'm going to feel happy again. Am I ever going to feel joy? For me, I felt like I was in a fog. It was like I was moving, but it was just so like, yeah, like that's the only way I can describe it. It was just like, I'm moving slowly. It's foggy, you know, but what happens when you reach out for help, when you find the thing, you know, I turn to animals, right? So I had other supports, therapy and friends and family and things like that. But for me, the healing came from being in the space of being with animals, right? So it was all of it together, but you are also a primary example. And I am also a primary example. And hopefully anyone else out there who feels like they can't get to this point, you can. Yeah. Oh but my gosh. You she have to do and what yeah. you did and what I did, which is something we haven't said is that you committed. Yeah. Like, like yeah. you made a decision. Yeah. Like I am committed to working on myself and then. And then you have started to have seizures. Like it's wild, right? Like, it's like, okay, great. I'm starting my healing journey. And then all of a sudden you have the seizure, you're diagnosed with this, you know, neurological disorder. You can't even speak and you still committed to heal. <laughs> yes. Which shows right? you folks, anybody can do it. Um, yes. anyone can and do it's it. your mindset. Like yeah. you made a decision that where you were like, no, I'm getting better. And yeah, it's not to say that it's easy. It's not yeah. to say that it's not difficult or it's not fun and that there aren't tears and anger and all of that stuff. But, you know, all that stuff is in our body and it's got to get out, right? Um, you know, if we're talking about somatics and, and things like that, all this yeah. stuff that we've repressed and pushed down for so many years. But if you're somebody who can, in your mind, make the decision to go, I don't want to be here. Yeah. I don't want to be in this place. I don't want to go backwards and I don't want to be in this place. I want to move forwards and I will do whatever it takes to get myself to a place where I feel more freedom, more peace, more joy, whatever it is that you're searching for. Yeah. Like you can do it. You just have yeah. to be able to get in front of the mirror, whether it's the horse is your mirror or yourself <laughs> or whoever is your support. And you have to be able to look at the ugly side of things. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can do sure. that, you're going to make it yeah. the other side. Yeah. It's so true. You, that dedication, that commitment to you. And I feel like when we look at our lives and we look at how much we've dedicated and committed to outside of ourselves, yes. almost every single person I would, I, I never like to say always or everyone, but I'm pretty sure pretty much everyone has committed or dedicated to something. So yes. they are capable of doing yes, for themselves great point. with support. Again, you know, don't think like, oh, I have to go through this whole transformational journey on my own and start just like from square one with nothing. No, of course, you know, you have the support, you get the networks you need, you get the resources you need, but we're all capable of it. But I think so many of us just diminish that, that capability, you know, in favor of believing the stories about self-worth or self-esteem or what have you. And that are kind of like lesser than, than where they really are. Um, but we all have the capacity to grow and we all, have, that's like, as a human being, that is your birthright is, yeah. is to grow. Like you are never oh, given a finite amount of times that you can transform. And I love that. Like, that's just, um, something that I love that I get to keep doing, which is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Leah. So please um, let us know where, where can people connect with you? How can they reach out? Yeah. So you can go on my website, www.ficacoaching.com. Fika is spelled F-I-K-A. Um, or you can follow me on Instagram at Fika Coaching. And those are really the two best ways to get in touch. Uh, if you want to email, it's just contact at FikaCoaching.com. Awesome. And I'll put all those links in the comments, folks, too, on YouTube. But it was such a pleasure to have you. I'm like, I know we could probably go on for hours more. Right. I will have yeah. to make another video at some point that goes into yeah. more detail about all the things that we've done. Um, but I hope that you found this helpful, everybody. Well, I think and we have to have you come and at least get some footage of Saint so people know who he yes. is. Yes, I will have to do like a proper maybe Instagram live when we don't get. Yeah, the there you go. Perfect. <laughs> Great.
But it was so great to see you. Thank you so much, Leah. You're welcome. Thanks, Gloria. Bye. Bye.